Hi, welcome to New Life today. In our service, I have a very dear friend of mine, Pastor Bill Wilson from Metro World Child, who is the founder of the largest outreach children's church sidewalk Sunday school in the world, averaging weekly about 220,000 children every single week that are being ministered to in the Philippines, New York, and in many nations around the world. He will challenge you with the boldness, the compassion, and the urgency, and the reality of the difference that you and I can make in everyday life if we'll step out of our comfort zones and our boxes of convenience and allow God to do something extraordinary and wonderful just through you and I when we make ourselves available. So I believe as you listen to Pastor Bill, you'll definitely be stretched and encouraged and realize God wants to bring some life into what might be a mundane, ordinary Christian life. Enjoy the message. The Lord's doing some outstanding things uh, all across Asia. Pastor and I were talking about it earlier. There's just some amazing things that are happening, and you guys need to know that you're a part of it. And I think sometimes you, it's, it's normal. You come to a church... It's a great church. You love the people. You love the pastors. Everything's great. You love the new cafeteria. I love the new cafeteria. I've already eaten there this morning, and I'm going to eat some more. And it's great, but it's easy to take this for granted. Please, look at me. Do not take this for granted. God's doing amazing things here. And sometimes we, we use words now, it's epic. It's amazing. What, it's awesome. You know, it just, what's awesome today was normal 15 years ago. But somehow now, it's epic. Um, God's doing something. That's not a cliche with me. I can't say that everywhere I go. But I can say it here. Because you sense it. So, uh, Pastor, thank you for letting me be a part of this. It's nice. There's only a couple of churches in the world that I really feel comfortable. Because I don't, I don't fit everywhere. Say it ain't so. Yeah, I don't fit everywhere. Um, and that's okay. All right? I used to think everybody liked me. But then I... And then I found out not everybody does. Because, you know, I can be very charming. Sometimes I have my moments, but I live life on a very intense level. You see in the video, the stuff you saw in the video wasn't just made for the video. That's a very small representation of my life. So when I speak to you today, understand it's just different. You have all kinds of speakers in here, and I'm sure... They're all great. Some of them, uh, if they're from America, outside of me and him, most of the American preachers, you know, they kind of got lace on their underwear, and they just kind of, you know, they don't have that. Me and him, we got it. You know what I'm saying? But not everybody, not everybody got it. It's part of getting older and wiser, the wisdom. But... Uh, but thanks, guys. When I got shot, I got a lot of emails from the Philippines uh, encouraging me. You guys were praying for me. And I knew it was from you guys, okay? Because there's only like one church in Alabang, and there may, might as well only be one church because this is the church. And I knew it was from you guys, so thank you for caring for me, for encouraging me. I can only say thank you. God bless you. Thank you guys so much. More than you know. Many of you, many of you guys, over the years that I've been coming here, you have sponsored uh, some of our kids. Can I get a close-up, guys? Which would be better on this one? That one? Which one, Pastor? Be a better close-up? The one in the back? Are we good? Good? Yep. All right. You'll have an opportunity today to take one child and say, hmm, I can't change a country. I get that. 
I, I, I struggle with that myself. Can't change a village, can't change a city, I understand. But today, you will have a chance to take one child and make such a dramatic difference. You guys know my story. Many of you do. When my mother, who was an alcoholic, left me on a street corner and left me, never came back, you know anybody could have picked me up. Anybody. Gang member, drug dealer, pedophile. And had that happened, 253,000, which we had in Sunday school Christmas week, would not have heard the story of Jesus. You see how this get? you see that just got real. Right there, it got real personal, and it got real. One man, one ordinary Christian, okay, stopped, picked me up, sent me to a Sunday school camp where I heard the story of Jesus for the very first time, and that set my life, watch me, it set my life on a different course. That's it. That's why I'm here. Uh, you see me now, but you didn't see me in 1960 when I was sitting on a corner, hadn't eaten for three days, not knowing where my life was, but one man, one ordinary Christian stopped. You guys will have a chance today to do that same thing. If you have not done this, I would encourage you. Can I use that word? I'll get you out of here in plenty of time to stop our Metro team members. We'll be back there. Books are straight. Sponsorship is to the right. It's 700 pesos a month. You can be as involved in the life of the child as you choose to be. The reason I am so passionate about this, pretty simple. I was this kid. Got it? I was this kid. No random pictures back there. Not just pictures of some kids. These are the kids that our team right here in the Philippines work with every single week. That's important. And Pastor said it so well in the first service. It's Philippine people taking care of Filipino children. Not depending on America, not depending on Taiwan. Not, wouldn't it be nice if we could get these kids sponsored by folks here that just care? That, that's what this is, guys. And because it's here, you can visit them. You can, you can be as involved in their lives as you choose to be. And we had one person. Actually, it was a year ago. Kind of interesting. Time's gone by quickly. But it was a year ago. We do a Sunday school in the North Cemetery. For those of you that have never been there or have never been to one of our Metro Sunday schools, I invite you. Come, see what we do. Be a part. Stop by. Talk to the team members. Ask how you can go visit. Just see how this thing works. And we had a sponsor from Singapore that was with us. And uh, we were doing Sunday school in the cemetery. And I saw some of the team members and the sponsor looking at this little girl. I came to the Sunday school, but they were looking at something right here. They said, Pastor Bill, come here and look at this. And I looked and there was a, there's a hole cut in her side. And she was born without the ability to normally go to the bathroom. She was, did not have the, the bodily structure to be able to do that. So once a week, they had to take her to the clinic, stick a tube in there, drain her. Now remember, folks, lives in the cemetery. If you have never been there, please come visit with us. Spend time. Understand this is your city, folks. This is your country. Okay? Come and see. See the big need. Okay? And the sponsor said, Pastor Bill, we need to help this little girl. I said, you're right. And so we got to talking. She went back to Singapore. She made some phone calls. 
I get on the phone with some of our sponsoring churches in Singapore, and uh, we were able to get a Christian surgeon to donate his services to do the operation that it would take to really take this little girl apart and put her back together again, to let her live a normal life. This is the only shot she's going to have, but not an easy operation, as some of you know. Had an anesthesiologist, Christian lady, said, I'll, I'll donate. Two Christian nurses said, we'll jump in. Thank God for Christian people. Come on. Thank God for Christian people that come together again. And I use this term, the power of partnership. It's this church, the team that we all work together between New Life and Metro, churches in Singapore, people from all across Asia coming together. We had to pay the bills for the hospital, but that's okay. We had some folks in Malaysia that stepped up, raised some money. We were able to get the hospital bill paid while they were getting ready to do the operation on this beautiful little girl. And uh, unfortunately, they were getting ready to, to set her up for this operation, and they found out her lungs were filled with worms from living where she lives. You guys know how this goes, okay? So it took several weeks to get that cleared up. And then, of course, the day comes. Here we go, operation time. Everybody's nervous. We had people praying all over the world, literally all over the world, praying for this little girl. The, the team was there. Everybody was ready. Uh, time came. Anesthesiologist went to work. An extremely long operation, nearly 10 hours. Everybody's waiting. Uh, but I'm, I'm thrilled to tell you that uh, the operation was a success. Uh, she's now got an opportunity to live a normal life because there were some Christian people that came together. This church, New Life Tondo, people from Malaysia. And I don't get this opportunity often, uh, but I'm taking it today. Uh, usually I just show pictures, and that's good, but it never quite is enough. But because we're here, we have a great opportunity. Pastor Herbie, sure. would you bring up Cherry Ann and the mom? We have the little lady that had the operation and her mother in the house. This is the little girl that one year ago didn't really have much of a chance. That's just a fact. But because a sponsor saw I preached a message here a couple of years ago. What do you see? She saw something in Cherry Ann. And we talked to the mom. And uh, let me tell you something. I didn't know this until a couple of days ago. She herself was born in the cemetery, living on the tombs. She was saying, born in the cemetery. She doesn't even have a bed. We decided the other day, we're just going to get her a bed now, trying to recuperate. Pastor Herbie, it's because of you, my friend, because of Tondo, New Life, because of Elabang, New Life, Sheriff. This lady here, you want to talk amazing? This is amazing. He's like really amazing, but she's like epic amazing. Okay? She made it happen. Yeah, Pastor, I remember the last year when we went there in the cemetery. And then you asked me, you told me to tell her that you would like to help yes. Cherry Ann. When I told that to Marie Chris, I was a little bit confused. Because it just, she just gave me like a dog look. Yeah. You know, like, uh, it seems like not interested. Yeah. When I told it to her that um, we're going to help her daughter. And then I got that now. Because... Last Friday when we went there, she told me, I heard it from her for the first time. You know what, what Marquis told me? Pastor, 
I thought because a lot of people already came here when she saw, when they saw my daughter telling that they will help, they will help, they will help, but they never did. But last year, you also said the same word. But you know what Maritis told me? Pastor, it's real. It's real. Now the word became flesh. It's real. And it's because of you guys. See, this is when a picture isn't quite enough. But when you see the mom, Shirley to went out, got him some clothes so they could come. You look so pretty. Give me a kiss. Thank you. This is, this is the demonstration, my friends, of Christianity. I said something in the first service. We can describe Jesus. We can describe everything about him, what he can do, what he did, who he is, and that's great. We need to. But there's a big difference between being describing Christians and describing who Jesus was and showing the world the demonstration of who Jesus really is and what he can do in the lives of people and churches when they come together in partnership to make a difference. Get your Bibles out quickly. Quickly get your Bibles out. If you don't have a Bible, slip over next to a Christian. They'll have one. You can look at this thing. Make sure you get this. Before we get into the message, which is going to be from the book of Acts, chapter number 14, we're going to uh, show some pictures of Syria. Uh, as you guys know, you all heard. I wish I'd bring the lights down. And uh, I forget who's doing the pictures. Who's doing the pictures? Brett. Brett. I get to yell at Brett for a few minutes. Brett, give me the first picture of Syria. I got over there six months ago. Uh, a long story of how I got there. But uh, I was brought from the Tel Aviv airport uh, to what is known as Camp 116 in Syria. It's a classified, uh, undisclosed location. They bring you in because it's surrounded with landmines, anti-personnel mines. Once you're in the camp, you're in. Give me another one, Brett. We're going to go through these and see what we've got here. That's a drone aerial picture of the camp where we were. The road up top is the main entrance. As I said, once the, they bring you in under armed guard, you're locked in. It's totally mined around there. The bottom road is where they bring the children in. Nine o'clock in the morning, they're brought in in the back of flatbed trucks. They drop them off and then pick them up at five, hoping that we can help. Uh, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. I told them, told this morning, a mom brought her son, little guy, I'm going to say 9, 10, uh, was in one of those attacks. You guys seen it on the news. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm not even going to go off on all that. Um, a piece of shrapnel from one of the bombing attacks cut off his hand. And they'd wrapped it up, and the mother took her son's hand, put it in a paper bag, and brought it to us. And through the interpreter, was asking me, can you help my son? Here's his hand. No. No, I can't help your son. Come with me sometime. Let's go. You understand what I'm saying? See, when you touch the urgency, when you touch the wounds in the body of Christ, it starts changing, folks. It just changes. And I looked at that hand in the bag. I thought, can't help. I can do a lot of things, but I can't do that. I wish I could. Give me another one, Brett. What else we got? So they stay in guard. Uh, we do our best. It was into the, give me another one, Brett. Uh, third evening, I got shot by a Russian sniper. It was a 308 caliber sniper rifle, almost the equivalent of an elephant gun. Uh, caught me in the back. What else you got, Brett? Uh, I had my bulletproof vest on because I knew I was walking into a war zone. I've had to wear this vest on a couple of occasions. 
will probably have to wear it when I go to Afghanistan again this year. But give me the next one, Brett. I think that's a picture. The bullet went into the vest. The, one of the metal plates inside the vest caught it, but busted the plate. And the, the metal plate went into my back, punctured my lung, uh, and then it, the impact of the slug then threw me forward. I hit my head on some rocks, fractured my skull. This is my fifth concussion. Now, uh, so I was airlifted by the Israeli army to uh, Jerusalem, to the hospital there, and then from there on to London. Uh, what else you got, Brett? Uh, when the Israeli army came, they pulled the bullet out of the vest. You see the impact on the plate, flattened the bullet. You see how big the thing was. That's in comparison to a half shekel, Israeli money. Uh, a gun like that, a slug like this, is designed to do one thing. It comes out of the barrel, spinning. When it hits, it opens like that, and it just rips open everything that it hits. Uh, what else you got, Brett? Was that? Yeah, that was a, one of the papers from Europe because that happened in October. Guys, you know me. You know that's my busiest time of the year. That's Operation Holiday Hope. We've got to get a gift for every kid in our Sunday school. And for many of them, that is Christmas. Us doing what you do by sponsoring a child, helping us do what we do. Again, that's, that's what moves this thing. That's what makes it work. I did a lot of television that time of year to get the support. I couldn't even stand up for 20 minutes, never mind a couple hours on TV. And all of a sudden, we send out emails, send out email blasts. People from here, from New Life, from all over Asia started supporting. And I'm thrilled to tell you, instead of nothing happening, which is what would have happened, because I was, I was still out trying to preach, but I'm coughing up blood. <laughs> I look like a vampire. I'm just, <laughs> I'm trying to preach. And, <laughs> and with all of the folks that jumped in, we had 253,000 in Sunday school. That's never been done in world history. You guys were a part of it. You helped make it happen. And it's been covered in papers all over the world because, again, you're going to get sick of me saying this. It's the power of partnership. Everybody doing something. That's what makes this work. Get your Bibles open. Acts. Chapter number 14. There was a title for the message today. There was a working title. Hmm. I think the title would have to be, The Miracle Was Not in the Miracle. Let me say it again. The Miracle Was Not in the Miracle. If you have never seen a real-life miracle in front of you, first person, I'm not talking about watching it on TV, not talking about reading a book. I'm talking about first person in front of you, seeing the miraculous. Hmm. I pray before you die that you will have the privilege of seeing the miraculous. Because there's something about witnessing the power of God demonstrated. You're going to hear that word used a lot in these last few moments. When you see it, and it's real, and it connects with you. Hmm. This 14th chapter of the book of Acts has been used in theology classes, has been used by preachers of all shapes and sizes to talk about the miraculous. I get it. It's great. It's a great miracle. But the miracle here, the real miracle, watch this was not in the miracle. I'm going to walk you through it quickly, and I'll get out of your way. See, when I got hit with the brick here, and I've talked about that a few times over the years that I've been coming here. You know, they hit me with a brick. This was years ago back in Brooklyn. Busted my cheekbone out, busted these teeth out. I just got them paid off, though. They look good, right? Just got them paid for. Uh... 
But I ended up being blind in this eye. A blood clot had cut off my optic nerve. Three months blind, driving the bus, going out doing what I do, trying to get kids sponsored. You know, I look at a patch of my, look like a stupid pirate. And so, frustrating time. I'm not a quitter. I don't even like quitters. If you're not going to finish, don't start. Let me say that again for the cheap seats. If you're not going to finish, don't start, man. Don't start. See it through. Finish it up. So when we told them last year we were going to get this done, we found another kid this week. Big, huge tumor. Again. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it in Jesus' name. We're going to find somebody that will say, I want to be the one that saves that. My God. I want to be the one that saves that kid's life. We're going to find somebody. We're going to get it done in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. So, I had the ticket to leave. I was quitting the ministry, quitting New York. I had the ticket, man. I had the ticket. I was gone. Tired. Wore out. You ever just been wore out? Just wore out. Tired. Tired of the fight. <laughs> you with me? Some of you are going, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, I get it. Um, it was a Sunday night. I was leaving JFK on Monday morning. I set the alarm for 6 a.m. Couldn't sleep. I knew my whole life was changing. I was quitting, walking away. Done. Hmm. Couldn't sleep. I, I remember looking at the clock about 3 a.m. I guess I drifted off after that. The alarm went off at 6. I leaned over. It was like yesterday. I leaned over, turned off the alarm, turned on the light. And when I turned on the light, I saw it. My pillow was covered with blood. And I could see fine out of both eyes. Somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., God came. I can see you fine today. Now, you are looking at a miracle. <laughs> you didn't think a miracle would look like this, did you? <laughs> I know. Just relax. Calm down. Do not be too disillusioned. You are looking at a living miracle. See, because I have experienced myself the miraculous. And on the flip side, I have been used as a conduit a number of times to allow the Holy Spirit to flow through me as a conduit. Didn't have nothing to do with me. I'm just a man of great faith. And I believe we can still lay hands on the sick and believe that they'll recover. Amen? So I've been healed. I've laid hands on a couple of deaf people. They were instantly healed. I don't talk about that much because then people think I've got a healing ministry. Okay? I don't have a white suit, so it just doesn't seem to fit. So it just doesn't make sense. I drive the bus. I'm a bus driver. That's what I do. I drive the Sunday school bus. I prayed for a couple of blind people. They were healed. Praise God. I prayed for a couple of dumb staff members. They were not healed. Two out of three. So not everything worked for me. But I'm uniquely qualified to speak about the miraculous. So when I speak to you from this 14th chapter of the book of Acts, I believe I've got a little juice to do this. So I'm going to walk you through it. It's going to be more of an exegetical type sermon, which I don't do those much. But I have to to make this make sense. So follow me closely. Are we recording this? Yes? Yes, we are. All right. You may not need this message today, but someday you're going to need this one. So you may want to get the tape, put it somewhere, and then when the opportunity comes where you're right here in this 14th chapter, you pull out the tape or flash drive or whatever thing else you got and lay it. What's happening here? Pick it up. At the, now, let's go to the eighth verse. Acts chapter 14, verse number eight. And there sat a certain man at Lystra. 
He was impotent in his feet, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. Now, I have a tendency to have a theological bend because of teaching in university, so I try to not do that on Sundays because I kind of get off on a tangent. I don't want to do that here. But there is a theological truth that's right in front of you. It's called the law of multiple definition. What does that mean? It means if a person, a place, a location, a condition is mentioned multiple times, it should arrest you. It should reach out and cause you to stop because if it's mentioned three times, there's something there that needs to be grasped. Are you with me so far? Look at the person next to you, smack them, and say, pay attention. Pay attention. you got to get this, guys. So let's go back to this and see, what, see what's being said here. Certain man, what's, what's going on? He's impotent in his feet, comma, crippled from his mother's womb, comma, who had never walked. Now, why is this important? There's a difference between someone, watch me, right here. Big difference between someone who, maybe because of a disease, uh, maybe because of an accident, that was not able to walk later in life, in comparison to someone who has never walked. Why? Because walking is what? It is learned experience. You learn how to walk. You don't, you know, baby just doesn't get up one day and maybe your babies do. I never seen a baby do that. Uh, it is a learned process. This man, don't miss this, this man has never walked. Got it? So log it away because I'm coming back to it. All right? Well, while we're on it, there may be somebody here that you've never been able to do something. I don't know. I don't know who's here. Some of you I know pretty well, but obviously not all of you. Maybe, maybe some of you here, maybe you've never been able to manage money. It's eluded you. You've tried, you've worked on it, but you just, just couldn't do it. Maybe some of you, maybe you've never been able to be responsible. You want to be responsible, but you just, you know, you ever meet those folks, just can't. Maybe you've never had a good relationship. You've tried, wanted to. Maybe some of you have never been able to keep your mouth shut. You almost did once, didn't you? And then at the last minute, you just had to open your mouth and say something stupid. I know. <laughs> some of you here, you struggled with some things. I get it. This man never been able to walk. It's learned behavior. You learn it. All right? So we've established this. So he's drawing attention to us here with this. This man's never walked. Give me verse 9, guys. Uh, let's see. The same, this crippled man heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving he had faith. See, <laughs> Paul looks at the guy and he sees something, okay? He sees that this man has faith. So for all of you that say, I'm a man of great faith, I'm a woman of great faith, I, I just keep it to myself. <laughs> Hogwash. Let me do that again. Hmm. If you have great faith, guess what? Everybody around you is going to see something. To, my God, it's the demonstration again. See, we can't get away from the word today. And we're going to work that thing until we're done. See, have you ever had somebody just come up to you and say, there's something different about you? Now, they say it to me a lot, but it's not for spiritual reasons. I, I wish it was, but normally it's not. So he says, he sees that the guy has faith to be healed. 
When people look at you, what do they see? I'm going to stop there and let that waft across the crowd. What do they see when they see you? Do they see you look like the kind of person that's been chasing parked cars all week? I don't know. Look at yourself in the mirror. Take, give, give me another one, guys. Give me, give me, give me number 10. Give me verse 10. Paul says with a loud voice. I love this when you read it in the Greek. It's really great. He yells at the guy. <laughs> Paul yells at the crippled guy. I love Paul. Just for no other reason, let's yell at the guy. Because sometimes you just need to yell at Hey! He yells at the crippled guy. <laughs> Come on. He yells at the guy. Loud voice. What does he say? Stand up and look at this. Look at this. Look at the B part of that verse. And he leaped and walked. Hallelujah. Now, isn't that interesting? This man could never walk. And in one step, see, what just happened? Not only... Did his physical body get healed? But I guess something else got healed because he knew how to walk. How did he know how to walk if he never walked? This, my friends, is an extraordinary miracle. See, is there such a thing as an ordinary miracle? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it's like A miracle, B miracle. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going to get into that. But this one, this one, sports fans, is an extraordinary miracle. Because the guy got healed physically. I guess he got healed mentally. Because he had to he had to know how to do something. So there's hope for some of you that can't keep your mouth shut. There is hope. So keep that in mind. All right? So we have established, first of all, that this now is an extraordinary miracle. Now, let's move quickly to verse 11. Give me verse 11, Brett. And when the people saw what Paul had done, notice that that first part there. See, a lot of people miss this. When the people saw what Paul had done, follow me, follow me. We're going somewhere here. They lifted up their voices, saying the speech of Laocanea, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Give me verse 12. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Give me verse 13. And then the priest of Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and garland under the gates, and they would have done sacrifice with the people. What are the people getting ready to do here? In their mind, my God, <laughs> in their mind, this miracle was so extraordinary, they knew these men got to be gods. Because like normal, ordinary, run-of-the-mill priests and those other pinheads that were around the temple at that time, they can't do that. So in their mind, this is, this is the real deal. So Paul and Barnabas, they've got to be, be gods. They're, they're, they're extraordinary. These are somebody... And, and, and before you think this is like weird old Bible stuff, some of you do the same thing with people today. You put people on a pedestal. <laughs> Don't look at me, cockeyed. You know you do. I, I see posters, soccer players, rugby, soccer, yeah, football, whatever you all call it, basketball. Yeah, it's a big deal, right? Basketball, baseball, yeah. Singers, those little sissy boy bands. Y'all got their posters. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Stupid stuff. You put posters up. So, there's some people in this country even do that with preachers. Uh, they put preachers way up on a pedestal. Where was I? Uh, somewhere. Somewhere in the States. It wasn't that long ago. And some... Some preacher, been on TV, turned out to be homosexual. People were shocked. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. Really? You know, I knew that boy walked funny. 
And I was going to say something once, but I thought, you know, well, we'll we just let it go. And they were sorry. People were offended and hurt. Come on, folks. What? Where, where's your Where's your faith? See, don't don't miss this. They're getting ready to make sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. Give me verse. Uh, give me the next. Yeah, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they rent their clothes, ran in among the people, crying out. Give me the next one, guys. And saying, sirs, why do you do this? We also are men of like passion with you. Don't miss this. Look at me. Look at me. Here it is. And here's the part of this whole story most people miss. They missed the whole point. Paul was very quick to say, it's not about us. Don't make sacrifices to us. Don't worship us. Why? Because we are just like you. Who you? Yeah, exactly. We all, we all alike. See, and that's where we miss this thing. Because we want, no, no, let me flip that. We would like to think that the only ones that can do and be used and make a difference are the special people, the hotshot people, the TV people. And so we flock to those people thinking we could never do that. We could never do anything of, of extraordinary difference because that's only reserved for the people that do extraordinary things. But now we see here that the men... The men that God used to do the miracle were no different than the man who received the miracle. You better let this sink, folks. You better take this one in real long, okay? Because once you understand there was an extraordinary miracle, and we do not debate the extraordinariness of the miracle, but... Here's the hook. Now we see God used ordinary people through the power of the Holy Spirit to be the channel for the extraordinary miracle. This is where all of a sudden you and I enter the picture. I was the kid left on the corner. I never knew I, how could I? How could the man that picked me up off the street? No, he could not. But all these years later, this extremely ordinary kid. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, you want to talk extraordinary? You want to talk about ordinary? You want to talk what? Which part? You want to look up there? Okay. You want to see the scars of the operations that I had? Because when I was little... My face was so deformed, I stuttered. I still have a deformed rib cage here because I had rickets from malnutrition. You want to talk ordinary? Bring it on. Let's go. Let's compare ordinariness. And yet, God uses ordinary people. We're it, my friends. We are it. It's never been about the hot shots. Never will be. It's about ordinary people like me and you. I, had, I lived in the church after my mother left me. I went to the camp, gave my life to Christ. She never came back. I had nowhere to live. So they let me live in a maintenance closet in the church that the man who picked me up went to. So I lived in the church. I still live in the church. I'm not sure what that means. I still live there. And that's okay. I'm good with it. But I had one lady, Christian lady. <laughs> Gotta love those Christians. He just... <laughs> she comes up, she goes, Sunday morning, right? So a little kid. She comes up, she you're gonna be an alcoholic, just like your mother. I'm just standing there. 
That Catherine Kuhlman, since we've already talked about her, we had her years ago in Florida doing a meeting. I walked in to speak to my pastor about the buses. Catherine Kuhlman, you don't even know who that is. Who that? You don't even know who that is. She stood up, got these, she had these bony fingers, just like mine. She pointed that finger. She said, young man, you're going to die a violent, untimely death. Okay. <laughs> and I just found out what to do with the buses and went on. Come on, folks. Come on. I've seen it all. I've heard it all twice. Come on. This was an extraordinary miracle. You're extraordinary. He leaped and he walked. He never walked. How is that possible? It's not possible outside of God. You know that. An extraordinary miracle. But then, we see, it was done through who? Me and you. How about it? You good? Come on. Done through ordinary people like me and you. How do you think this works, folks? It's ordinary people. How do, you, how do you think this little girl right here had her whole life turned around, encouraged the mother, gave a little girl a chance for a life? The little girl in the first service, her foot was growing backwards. Another sponsor saw her, said, we're going we're gonna to help her. The kid, what was it, Joan Lynn? What was her name, Herbie? Jonah Lynn. Big old, huge tomb. She was at the uh, Sunday school by the railroad tracks where we were. What was the name of that place? Um, railway, um, Realiston Tren, Tayuman. Okay. Doing Sunday school over there. Look, what chance did the... Let me tell you something. The guys you see on TV preaching, they ain't going to go where these people go. And that sounds bad, and that sounds harsh, and he may never invite me back here again. But the truth is, you ain't going to see those boys out there where these team members are, where the people from your church are, where the people from New Life Tondo are every week, pouring their guts out, finding kids like what you've seen up on this platform today. Never been about the hot shots. You've got a lot of people that love the crowds, but they hate people. And I'm just going to let that sit right where it is. Extraordinary miracle done through ordinary people like me and you. Any ordinary people here? Anybody ordinary? Yeah? Wait a minute. Hold on. Let me get... So I got to get... I already did. <laughs> Ordinary people. But it's always been about ordinary people that choose to do the extraordinary things. Look at somebody and say, I'm pretty ordinary. I'm pretty ordinary. Guess what? You're qualified. You are. My God, I want to slap somebody. <laughs> I just want to grab somebody right now so bad and just shake the stuffing out of you. It's us. Guys, look at me. It's us, me and you. The kid left on the corner. The kid with the deformed face. The kid that nobody wanted. That nobody wanted. But see, God uses the ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Are you with me? I know you are. My time's gone. But before we go, as one last part, one observation I made. We'll see if it makes sense to you. Because before you get too excited with your ordinary self, thinking, yeah, I got this. So before you get too jacked up, there's one last part. Give me verse 19, Brett. Let's check it out. Ah, and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch, and Iconium. Hmm. Now, who are these people? All of a sudden, another group of people now shows up. We got an extraordinary miracle done through ordinary people, and there came certain Jews 
There came things. You know who these people are? These are the church people. These are the religious people. It says they came thither. I hate it when church people come thither. Because you know when church people come thither, it ain't never good. It ain't never good. So here come these guys. They persuaded the people to stone Paul. Took him outside the city. They didn't go out to talk theology. They didn't talk to him about the implications of the miraculous. They came to kill him. They came to kill him. Hmm. But the problem is they made one mistake. There it is. They thought he was dead. (laughs) But God raised Paul up as a testimony in the middle of the whole mess. Now, what do we got? What do we got? We've got an extraordinary miracle, right? Got it? Done through ordinary people. Got it? And then, (laughs) when that happens, then you come under an extraordinary attack. They didn't come to just talk to him. They came to kill him. I wondered for years, why why did my life go the way it went? It took me a long time. I got into it with some German guy over in Germany. He, He wanted to bet me that he had a tougher life than me. I said, yeah. I said, put up some money. I ain't doing this for nothing. So I put up $100. He put up 100 euros. Said, uh, he said, you want to go first? I said, yeah, I'll go first. I started from the time I was little. My sister was a prostitute. I saw things like a little kid should never see. Never talk about it. Very seldom mention it. No reason to. Dad dead. Mom gone working in a bar. I used to clean the toilets in the bar she worked at on Saturday morning. You want to know why we have Sunday school on Saturday morning? You didn't know that, did you? Yeah. I meant what I used to do on Saturday morning. Went through the whole thing. There when my former, when my home pastor killed himself, when the cops knocked down the door, his hand was reaching for the phone. I don't know. I don't know. You want the stories? I got the stories. I watched them come and go. Yeah. 50 years I've been doing this. It's a long time. It's a long time. So, never understood why, but I think the devil knew. He did everything he could to try to destroy me before I ever got to New York. See, because he knew that if I ever got to New York, guess what? And now, and now, and I didn't think of this till just now. I just thought of this. He did his best to try to destroy me when I was a little boy. Because he knew that one day, one day, we'd be by the railroad tracks. One day, I'd be walking through Ethiopia. One day, I'd be in Syria. And he knew it wasn't so much of what I was doing then, but what I was going to do. You ever wonder why the enemy attacks you? You ever wonder why things are thrown at you? You get it now? It's not because of what's happened in the past. It's because of what God's got planned for you, for your future. Extraordinary miracles always done through ordinary people, but you better get ready because when you step outside the box, when you step out the framework of normal Christianity and you do something extraordinary for God, you're going to come under an extraordinary attack. And I was laying in the desert wondering if this is it or not. But see, the Russians made one mistake. (laughs) They thought I was dead. They should have shot me twice. Because once 
You can't shoot me just once. It doesn't work. It's happened twice now. You can't kill me. So if some of you get some big ideas, don't. Because I'll turn it around. <laughs> shoot you myself. That's right. That's right. You can't kill me. See? Because now I've understood. I've understood. Yeah. If it doesn't kill you, I guess it really does make you stronger, doesn't it? Hard lessons to learn. Extraordinary miracles always done through ordinary people. But if you choose to be that channel for the miracle working power of God, get ready because you're going to come under some extraordinary attacks. But greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world. It's time for the miraculous. It's time for somebody to stand up and say, God, use me. I'm ready. Stand to your feet. Lift your hands. Father, I'm asking for my friends. Because, God, we've watched in your word today. It's always been about ordinary people. The little boy left on a corner. The little girl lived in a cemetery. The little people that just say, I'm a nobody. Congratulations. Yeah. You're qualified to be a part of God's army. To do some things that everybody else said you can't do. They told me I was going to be an alcoholic like my mother. Nope. Not today. Not today. So, Father, strengthen my friends. Let them walk out of here encouraged today as ordinary people who choose to do extraordinary things and are willing to face the extraordinary attacks. Let them know I sure love them. In Jesus' name. Amen. I believe what you just heard probably has stretched you, challenged you, maybe irritated you. I don't know. Uh, Pastor Bill has an unction to comfort the afflicted or afflict the comfortable, whichever way it works. But you and I, in the way that we live our lives, the love that we have for God, the faith that's alive in our hearts, we can make a difference. And if we just make ourselves available, it's his ability working through us that can do some extraordinary things. Take the pressure off yourself. It's not like you have to perform it. Just make yourself available. And you'll be amazed at the words that can come out of your mouth, the kindness of the touch, or the miracles that can flow from your hand, or how working together with other people through loving and giving can bring incredible response into other people's lives that can change their future forever. And that's really what Christianity is all about, not just meeting in a service, hearing some words and singing some songs, which worship, worship is great, and hearing God's Word is great. But it's an active involvement in everyday life where we make it real and see Jesus live through us. God bless you. Pray to see you again next week here in New Life. Have a great week.